After, after last week, considering some things from Romans 14 and kind of looking that, yes, probably there are things in life that, like eating meat or not eating meat, that I can glorify the Lord potentially on both sides of the matter. I can eat and glorify the Lord, or I could not eat, if my conviction is such, and glorify the Lord. And you remember we looked at it that we considered there are some things in life that definitely fall in that category. And there are some other things that we would say are not matters of conscience. You can't, you can't be on both sides of the issue and please the Lord. And there are a number of things that we could give examples of that fall into that category. Obviously, if you have some, like Matt talked about this morning, if somebody comes along, whether even an angel, and they, they have a gospel that is different than the one that Paul preached. Let them be accursed. Obviously, we, have, we allow no latitude as far as the way a man is saved. We can't, we can't tolerate opinions that differ. You can't, you can't say that Christ saves and something else saves and come at it from both sides and glorify the Lord. And I had made the comment last week that I had the mind to give a whole sermon dedicated just to trying to figure out what in the world goes into each of these two categories. And so I sat down on Thursday and I had some other things that I had to attend to that day as well, but the, the greater part of that day I devoted to really pouring myself into this and then the greater part of Friday... And I, I had happened to me much like what Matt had happened to him. I got to the end of Friday and I just spent a lot of time praying and I finally came back in and I had nine to three to four pages, which is which four pages is typically about good for, for the sermon I'm going to do. And I had three or four pages and I came in and I just deleted the whole thing. And I thought, you know what? The Lord doesn't want me to do this. And... You know, there are definitely things that we are not going to be able to allow in our church. Just like Matt said in the Sunday school. Our focus has to be Christ. And we cannot tolerate anything else. But if our focus is Christ... There's a number of things in our life that it's very possible to glorify Christ with even though you may come to a conclusion about it that's opposite than the conclusion I come. One person esteems one day as better than another while another esteems all days alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. The one who observes the day observes it in honor of the Lord. The one who eats, eats in honor of the Lord, since He gives thanks to God, while the one who abstains, abstains in honor of the Lord and gives thanks to God. For none of us lives to Himself, and none of us dies to Himself. If we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So then whether you live or whether we die, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end Christ died and lived again, that He might be Lord, both of the dead and the living. Why do you pass judgment on your brother? Or you, why do you despise your brother? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God, so that each of us will give an account of himself to God. Therefore let us not pass judgment on one another any longer, but rather decide or judge that's really the word there. Paul uses the same word he's been using, judge. Rather, judge never to put a stumbling block or hindrance in the way of a brother. Brethren, you know what? We need this. You need this. I need this. 
I can't speak for all of you, but I can speak for myself. I meet Christians. We, ha we have them come here. I meet Christians who visit the church. I'll, I'll at lunch sometimes talk with people. We'll have new people come to the church here. They'll be in the fellowships. We'll get into discussions. Or I hear from somebody else, do you know what so-and-so believes? Well, no, I didn't know that. Or yes, I, I did know that. Or I get emails from people. Or I get phone calls from people. And the people don't always appreciate what I believe about certain things. And probably at times I don't appreciate things that they have convictions about. There are differences. Sometimes I hear that somebody believes, like Richard and I, we just, what was it? Wednesday night. Richard has this certain view that, that, that Christians, or maybe a pastor like myself, should not perform marriages on um, lost folks. And, uh, you know, I don't agree with him. He doesn't agree with me. And I, I just looked at him and I, I smiled as we were having this discussion. And I just, I just realized, you know, how much I love my brother and I, I don't mind having a difference with him at all. But we come across that. I come ac now look, there are some people that I, I've got some people whose opinions about Michael Jackson are not what Craig's are, and I'm I'm getting some of the most rabid emails. I'm not Craig only been getting a few of them, but <laughs> they are not happy. And we get this. We we come across people with differences. But I'll tell you here, folks, there's no question about it. You and I are going to have differences with the world. In fact, you know what? If you don't, you've got some problems. If you don't have any differences with the world, that means you're part of the world. When Diego prayed just a second ago, he talked about being transformed. You know, in this very section of Scripture, we were told something at the beginning of the practical section of Romans. Do all of you remember what it was? Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Thoughts. Thinking. And you know what happens? Something happens in our minds when we come across people that disagree with us. Is that not the case? Beloved, I can tell you, what, what happens when we encounter people who disagree with us. Now look, it's expected you're going to disagree with people out in the world. But what Paul's concerned about is the blood-bought children of God. What happens when those who are brothers and sisters in Christ don't see eye to eye on things? I'll tell you what happens when you, when I, when we suddenly are in a conversation or we suddenly hear about or we suddenly are confronted by people with an opinion that's different than ours. Something happens guaranteed all the time. Now look, a whole number of things could happen, right? But there's one thing that always happens. Your mind goes to work. Right? It doesn't happen in a vacuum. Thoughts begin to go in your mind. You begin to process things. It's, you know what? If I look at my brother and I say, I love him. And I am going to be absolutely gracious to my brother even though he and I don't see eye to eye on it. That's, that's happening in the mind. You're, you know, when you become critical of another, when you become hostile towards another, when you become despiteful and despising and, and sarcastic and judgmental of another, it's happening in the mind. Because what happens typically 
is we begin to process maybe more objectively the data about what they believe. Now, why would they believe that? I mean, we, you know, we look at that and we consider what it is they're saying, what it is they're believing, and if you're a Christian, typically, our mind is to be renewed by what? By the Word of God. So, look, if you're a child of God, any, you're constantly putting everything in life through this biblical filter, right? That's what God wants us doing. That's what Paul exhorts us to do. As Christians, you're not conformed to the mindsets of the world. Our mindsets are controlled by the Word of God. And so when I come across somebody that disagrees with me, typically, if I am a Christian and I am maturing and I have some degree of, of spiritual um, ability given by the Spirit of God, I'm possessed of the Spirit of God, I belong to the Lord, the, the Word of God resonates in my soul. When you say, well, my opinion on that is this, I tend to pull up all these scriptures, right, that kind of support my position. And I start examining what you believe in light of these texts that I kind of have that support my position. And I may look at all those and I say, I, I don't think you're right. But see, typically they're doing exactly the same thing. But we can oftentimes forget that. We, we kind of, you know... We kind of have most of it. Well, you know, I've got this spreadsheet of scriptures I'm referring to. They must not be doing that or, you know, they wouldn't be ending up in a different place. But then what happens, folks, is, that, and that's good. You know what? We need to be Berean in our spirit, do we not? We need to be searching the Word of God. We need to be knowing what the Word of God says. We need to, brethren, I've, I've read Spurgeon on this years ago. I've never been able to find the quote again, but he said something like, brethren, if we're going to be wrong, let us be wrong clinging to the Word of God. And you know what he means by that. Not that we ought to be wrong, not that we knowingly are wrong, but if in the end, as much as we think we're right, let us think we're right based on the Word of God. Not on our own assumptions, not on our own opinions, not on the world's opinions, let us go to the Word of God. Let us bank our faith on that. Let us come to our convictions based on this Word. But you know what happens in the mind, right? As we're processing this thing, we can get to a point where our thoughts turn away from not so much anymore the objective filtering through the Word of God, but we begin to make assumptions as to why they don't agree with us. And a lot of times those are not nice assumptions. We come to critical assumptions. We come to judgmental assumptions about why they are the way they are. Listen. Oh, if this, this, this uh, has a potential to just create all sorts of stuff, I guess. But I'm going to risk it and go here. Let's take this head covering thing. I brought that up last week because I've had, I've had things in my past. I've had issues come up. I've had lots of situations in my life where I have confronted people with differences about the head covering. Well, let's think about this. Okay, we get thinking about the head covering. I know there are some here who believe that they should wear one, and others are not convinced that they should wear one. And if you're a man, you probably shouldn't even be in the discussion at all. <laughs> some of you ladies might not be sure. Gentlemen, don't start wearing head coverings. <laughs> but let's say, okay, let's say here you are. You're, you're a person who is quite persuaded that you shouldn't wear head coverings. You're one of these people. And here comes this sister who is quite persuaded she ought to wear one. And uh, you fall into a conversation with this person. As the discussion proceeds, now look, if, if, you, if you're going to even have any kind of knowledgeable discussion, isn't it amazing? E even, even in the Bible reading this morning, I didn't plan any of that. Here, here the text happens to be 1 Corinthians 11. 
The Lord worked that out. Look, if you're going to have any discussions about it, you really have no right to have discussions about it. You really have no right to express your disapproval to other people if you don't know what the Word of God says. Listen, one of the problems that a lot of people have is they want to they want to act in authority on something they never really looked at God's word. If you haven't been Berean about a situation, best thing for you to do is kind of keep quiet in the conversation. We had, too many people love to give their opinions whose opinions don't really flow out of a out of a careful study of the word of God. But look, if if you're engaging a person and the both of you have different positions on this, I'll tell you what ought to be happening. Something ought to, again, something ought to be happening in the mind. You ought to begin to think about 1 Corinthians 11, first 16 verses. And you ought to be filtering that through your mind. And if, look, and if you're the person that isn't convinced, you ought to be thinking, well, what is it, about verse 13? It says, it says judge for yourselves. Is it, is it possible that that there was a certain cultural judgment that was made there, especially in light of verse 16 as well. Paul specifically talks about what the practice of the churches were in that day. And the truth is, we could not say today what Paul said then. He said that the practice of the churches then was in fact that they did wear them. Now look, I'll tell you this, you're twisting Scripture all over the place if you come to any kind of conclusion that 1 Corinthians 11 is talking about hair. Or if you come to the conclusion that Paul is not saying that you should wear the head covering. He is saying the ladies should wear it. You, do, you can't argue that, folks. We have a lot, of, a, a lot of people that are just a lot of times refusing to see what the Word of God plainly says. We, got, we have to let the Word of God speak to us. But if you're running that through your filter, you're saying, yes, I realize he's doing that, but is there a possibility that there is a cultural aspect there? Just like there may be cultural aspects to foot washing or walking the second mile, things that were particular to their day and age, but if we really looked at the practice of our churches today, we would maybe come to a different conclusion. And so you're trying to process this, and the other, the, the sisters over there, and and she likewise is processing this thing. And she's saying, she's saying to herself, yeah, but Paul's basing his argument on creation. He's basing it on the very nature of God Himself. I'm not ready and willing to write this thing off to a cultural thing. Where the other person is saying to themselves, that's right, Paul is, basic, is basing women being in a submissive role on creation. But maybe there are, there are cultural ways that that expresses itself. And so both of them may be thinking they've come to these conclusions because they have studied the Word of God and they're filtering them. And that's good. That's very good. That's healthy. That is a strong church when we have people doing that. But I'll tell you where the breakdown is. The breakdown is when the person that isn't convinced begins to say in their mind, in their thoughts, well, the reason that sister... You know what? That sister is her problem is she's old fashioned. I mean, come on. That, that, that's, that's from, or, or she's cultish. It seems like something they do in cults. Or come on, my, our pastor's wives don't wear them. John MacArthur's wife doesn't wear them. John Piper's wife doesn't wear them. This lady probably has come to the... Con I mean, why would, why would they think that? They have all this knowledge of the Scriptures, and then there's this lady over here. It's probably because she's inferior somehow. You see, when our thoughts begin to go that way, it's probably because she's unstudied. What we begin to do is posture ourselves in this superior position. But just as easily, the other lady can begin to say... You know what? I'm in the superior position. And begins looking down on the other lady. She begins to think in her own mind that, well, 
God has given me light on something that God hasn't given other people light on. Thinking that God speaks to her in ways He doesn't speak to others. And brethren, all this goes on in the mind. It comes out in expressions. It comes out in words. It comes out in different manifestations. But it's all a product of what's processing in our minds. Brethren, as we're going to see down in verse 15 of Romans 14, Paul's still on this theme of love, which he has been ever since 12. He wants us to be these living sacrifices to God. He wants us to live not conformed to the ways of this world, but to be renewed in the mind. And I'll tell you what needs to be happening in our minds is we need to be thinking right. Look at Romans 14.4. If you don't believe that this is what Paul has in mind here, I I think you're going to see that he, he indeed does. He's concerned about the way we think, the way we believe, because that's going to affect the way we act, the way we live. Look at this. Who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? Brethren, who are you? Who are you? And you know what he does in the, in the couple of times that he really presses that upon us? Who are you? To really think about us. He immediately takes us to Christ. And I'll tell you why. Because when we see Christ, we begin to realize who we are. When we realize Christ is Lord, we realize we're not. When we realize Christ is going to be on the judgment seat at the end, we realize we're not the ultimate judge. He wants... Our minds filled with who Christ is. As our minds are filled with who Christ is, our minds become aware of who we are. Who are you? You know one of the reasons that we judge others is because we forget who we are. We forget who Christ is, and by forgetting that, we forget who we are. Renewed minds, brethren. Renewed minds. That's what He's pressing upon us. Brethren begin to unrighteously judge one another. They're not thinking straight. They're not thinking straight on who they are. Listen, if this church is going to survive all our various differences, press forward in harmony in the Gospel, in the, like Matt said, Matt hit it on the head, Our church has to be all about the glory of Christ. It's got to be central to Christ. Our lives have to be lived for Him, out of love for Him. And we need to love one another because of Him. And through the power of Him. And through the right thinking of Him. And minds that are consumed with Him. When our minds are consumed with Him and our minds are consumed with the cross and our minds are consumed about why He went to the cross, our minds are consumed with the Gospel, our minds are consumed with this person and the glory of Christ and we begin to realize He is glorious and in and of ourselves we're not. The only glory we get, the only thing that comes to us that lifts us out of the pit is what we get through Him. And He's the judge, we're not the judge. He's the Lord. We're not the Lord. We begin to realize all that and process that and let our minds be renewed by all that. It's then that we're going to be able to persevere and press through all the differences. Listen, as our church grows, more and more differences are going to come in. We need transformed minds. That means there needs to be a transformation in the way we think. Listen, brethren, before you spout off from the mouth, you Uh, and, and you criticize unrighteously, you have already come to that place in your mind. Already. How many of us would have been so greatly benefited if we had said, before we got to that point, if we'd asked ourselves, who are we? Brethren, let me tell you something. A year and a half ago, I was at a conference. Many of you know about it. A series of training meetings led by 
Brother Andy. Many of you have seen those videos. You know what happened there over the course of five days? We had training sessions that basically dealt with man's life, a man's theology, a man's preaching and teaching, a man's view of the church. It had to do with men that lead, that preach. Five days of this. At one point, I think it was you know midway on the first day somewhere, I asked him, a question about 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 17. If you're familiar with that, you don't look there, but it's, it's the text that deals with men who rule well and men who labor in teaching and preaching. And I asked him a question about that, and he, he gave his answer. In fact, we just heard this yesterday um, on the way to Joshua's basketball game. Here is exactly, after he gave his answer, here is, listen, Andy was in a room full of men who likely in a number of areas would not see eye to eye in, with him on everything. And here he is boldly standing up and proclaiming these, these answers to my question and, and saying all these other things as well. Do you know what he said when he was all done? I'm going to give you his exact words. He says, you understand that when I'm giving these answers, I'm giving them based with this qualification. This is my present understanding. Based upon my present understanding of what the Scripture says, subject to more light and correction. What's so striking about that answer, he's speaking to a lot of men who no doubt disagree with him and have opinions that are contrary to his opinions in a number of places. And do you know what goes on in a man's mind when he makes a statement like that? He realizes who he is. You see, for a man to stand up and say, this is my opinion, if you fight with me about it, you're somewhat less godly than I am, somewhat less learned, somewhat less taught, somewhat less spiritual, somewhat less something. Looking down, you're forgetting who you are. When a man answers like this, you know, you know how a man gets to the place where he answers like this? having been a young Christian at one time in his life, who was absolutely dogmatic about everything he believed, came storming in like a hurricane very often times, and you just enough times in your life, you then have to hang your head with your tail between your legs and admit that you were dead wrong. Enough times you so boldly waltzed in and said, well, God showed me, implying God hasn't shown you, He's shown me. And then to come along later and realize, well, actually, that probably wasn't God showing you. That was your own prideful opinion. And now you've had to come clean and admit it. Brethren, you go long enough in this Christ, just as Paul said, None of us know anything fully yet. <clears throat> You've been around the block a few times, you begin to realize, I don't know everything. I don't have all the light. You see, it's a proper reflection on who He is. You see how we avoid the contention and the strife the quarreling, the looking down at others when we approach things that way. <clears throat> Even in the church, I've heard this before. Two people strongly disagree on something in the church. And the preacher's up there preaching on something and he says something that seems like it kind of hits on the note that this guy believes and this guy doesn't believe. And suddenly that guy over there shouts out, Amen! 
And really all that did was sow the seeds of division in the church. And he knew it. And he meant it to do it. Or we come along and we seem like these spiritual giants and we say about things, the Lord has shown me. And we imply, although we may not even mean to, you can imply, He hasn't shown you. Now look, God shows His people truth. That isn't to argue with that. But a whole lot of the times we can become quite convinced the Lord has shown us truth. As we mature, we may come to realize Well, even though He did show us a little bit of it, He certainly didn't show us all of it. Or maybe even sometimes what I thought was something He had shown me, I come to realize I may have been wrong about that. Brethren, think about who you are. Paul wants us to think very particularly about two things. As we think about who we are, and who Christ is. Two particular things. Notice again Romans 14.4. Who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? Now brethren, you realize of course, this is a rhetorical question. Paul isn't looking for an answer. He's wanting to make a point. He's not expecting you to come back with, well, I'm a seminary graduate. I I think I am... I I think that qualifies me to pass judgment or I'm a pastor or any of that. No! It's not what he's saying. Paul's point is, you are not the master of the guy that you disagree with. Bottom line, let that thought grip your minds. That's a renewed mind kind of thought, isn't it? That when I come to somebody, I realize I am not the master here. Listen, you know one thing that was interesting to me? Paul said in 1 Corinthians 11, I noticed this when it was being read this morning, factions in the church are necessary. Isn't that interesting? It shows who's real. Now we might think, we might just think, well what he means there is when there's a faction, when two people are on the opposite sides of something, what it does is is it shows who's true and who's false because there's always going to be one side that's true and one side that's false. I don't think that's exactly what he means. Now that could happen sometimes. But I think what really proves who's true and who's not true when you have faction is more along the lines of this. Is there something about the way we deal with one another when there is faction that gives proof that we're the real thing and we're the genuine thing and that we're dealing with one another graciously? and out of love. And that we're thinking right. Brethren, do we think right? We're not master of the situation. Can I tell you this? We, we can... You see, one of the things is we have this idea that when we come along to something in the Word of God, okay, I've got my conviction about the head coverings, I want everybody on board. And the Lord of glory, the Lord of this church, actually does not want everybody on the same page. I read something in 1 Corinthians 11 about angels. You know what? It may be the Lord says, I've redeemed this group of people. Watch this. I'm going to convict some of these people to wear these head coverings and some of them not. Both based on my word. Both doing it in honor to me. Angels, come over here and gather and watch this. Watch how they graciously deal with one another. Watch how the very power of the cross affects them. Because that wouldn't happen to the people out in the world, but watch how it happens here in the church. And see, we're back saying, we want our way, we want our way. And we're not the Lord. We're not the Master. And the other person that we're dealing with, they have to answer to the Lord. We don't have to answer for them. We have to answer for us, me, myself. Brethren, can you imagine... Can you imagine if, there's Diego over there. Can you imagine if I, if I walk up to Nadelka and I say, Nadelka, I do not like the color of your sweater. <laughs> and, and there's Diego standing there and he looks at me and he says, but I do. <laughs> you see where I'm getting with that? I mean, 
for me to rant and rave about the fact that I don't like it, Diego might say to me, who do you think you are? Which is exactly what Paul is saying right here. Who do you think you are? This person stands or falls before their own Lord, and their Lord will make them stand. See, sometimes we have this attitude that if we don't fix people, they're not going to get fixed. Almost like God is impotent unless we get on the scene and make our views known. Brethren, do you forget He's the Lord of glory? He's the sovereign Lord who, with the pronouncement of His word, the universe stood forth, separates seas, looked sin in the face and conquered it. Do you forget that's the Lord of the guy over there with the different... Do you, do you realize? Look, now that's not to say that if a man's wife pulled out a knife and wanted to do harm to herself, and I went over there and I prevented her from it, obviously the husband isn't going to look at me and say, who do you think you are? He's going to say, he's going to realize I'm lovingly trying to protect his wife. Now there's a difference. If somebody has an opinion in the church that is harmful to themselves or harmful to the church, obviously we're not talking about things like that. But brethren, we have a terrible tendency here. The Lord, remember, the Lord is the Master. You and I are not. We need to ask ourselves and question ourselves and think on this all the time. When things come up in the church, I am not their Master. I am not their Master. Pray to their Master for them. If, if you're concerned about something, but in so many areas, we, just, we, need to, we, we need to study our Scriptures. We need to exhort and encourage one another from the Scriptures. But bottom line, when folks come to opinions based on the Word of God and they come to convictions based on there, it's not our place to say, this is our church position. Adhere to it or get out. That's not, that's not it. We, look, this may... I realize there are people from the outside that look at this and say, well, the reason they do that over there is because they're compromising. Brethren, it isn't compromise. It's living with renewed minds. It's living Romans 14 kind of lives. You know one thought he wants going through your mind? You're not the Master. He is. Do you know another thing He wants going through your mind all the time as you interact with other Christians? Look there at Romans 14 and verse 10. Again, another rhetorical question coming at us. Meant to make a point, not to get an answer. Why do you pass judgment on your brother? Or you? Why do you Despise your brother, for we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. So then each of us will give an account of himself to God. Wow! Paul brings out the big gun. The judgment seat of God. Can I tell you something? I don't know that I can adequately express to you the judgment seat of God. It is a day that is going to be filled with terror, I mean even, even the redeemed. I think we will be awed, amazed, overjoyed, and terrified at the same time. That man or that woman who comes before him and finds that they don't receive his approval, there are no words to express the horror of those simple words, depart from me. 
It is a day that is going to be like any other day that men and women have ever known. And Paul says, when you are dealing with brothers and sisters with different opinions, your mind needs to be renewed with this thought. Your life is quickly moving towards a judgment. And you will stand there. You notice, you notice what he's doing here? We will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then each of us will give an account of himself to God. You say, oh wait, I'm a Christian. Yeah, that, he's talking to Christians. He's talking to Christians and he's saying, look, just because you may sit there and you may have the faith in Jesus Christ and you may be thinking that all is well with your soul and your trust is resting there, and that may be good and valid and true and, and all that. He says, look, there is a judgment day coming and how you treat one another. Remember, you're not the master. You're also not the judge. And the master of those other people is the judge and he's going to judge you. And so you better be very careful and you better tread very carefully in the kind of opinions you come up with, the kind of judgments that you come up with, and how you esteem others who profess Christ. You better be very, very careful. Brethren, he wants us to feel the weight of individuality here. Judgment is coming. The implications are certainly that you will give an account all by yourself of how you may think, I don't even remember those things. God does. Because when you get to the book of Revelation chapter 20, it says there's books there. And it's all being recorded. What, how you lived your life, it's in the books. And it says in that day, those books are going to be opened. And how you lived your life is going to be spelled out there. The thoughts you had, how you scorned, criticized, rolled your eyes, How you treated God's children. Brethren, have you never read this? Matthew 7, verse 2, For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Do you know what that tells us? It tells us that on Judgment Day, basically what God is going to do is He's going to open the books and He's going to say, here is how you judged other people. Now, let's make that the standard by which you're going to be measured. That's exactly what that means. You say, yeah, but that doesn't, that doesn't apply to, to, to Christians, right? Who do you think he was talking to? When he sat down at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, yeah, there were a lot of people there. But it distinctly says... His disciples, and he taught them. And here's what he's saying to them. He's looking guys like Peter and Thomas and James and John and Bartholomew and Andrew. He's looking them in the eyes and he's telling them this. And he's saying, look guys, by the way you judge others, that's the way you're going to be judged in that day. What does that mean? It means simply this. That if you've been born again, if God has come down upon you and invaded your life and given you a new heart, if your faith in Jesus Christ is real and the Spirit of God has been unleashed in your life, then there's going to be something in the books by which you will be measured by that is going to be evidence that that transformation took place. And basically, if the measuring rod that comes out of those books is one of criticism and harshness, you've just censored others, frowned upon others, despised others, then He tells you, 
God is going to say, okay then. You did not show mercy when you judged others. Now you're going to be shown none. You were harsh. Now you'll have harsh. Exactly according to justice, yes. But justice is a harsh thing. Matthew 5, 7. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. And on the other hand, James 2.13, judgment is without mercy to one who is shown no mercy. Brethren, this is a reality. When you encounter people who see parts of Scripture different, who have different convictions, different opinions, let that thought just flood into your minds. I'm not these people's master. The Lord Jesus Christ is. I'm not these people's judge. The Lord Jesus Christ is. And He is also my judge. And He's watching. And He's got a lot to say in the Scripture about the fact that what He sees is the same way I'm going to be judged in the end. Let your judgment of others be the kind of judgment you want in that day. You say, but what if I look at them and I really do see sin? What if they are in sin? What if their opinion is wrong? Still be careful. Right? Isn't that what Scripture says? Galatians 6.1 Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him one in a spiritual of a spirit of gentleness. Two, keep watch on yourself. You know what that tells us? Even when I see sin in somebody else, Paul's saying, you better remember who you are. Remember who you are when you come to evaluate their opinions and their convictions, and even when you see sin in them, you better remember who you are. You are still capable of the same sin they are. You're capable of wrong opinions yourself. You're capable of misinterpreting things. You're capable of being overly harsh. You're capable of stumbling into the same transgressions. And you better be careful. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. Brethren, people who are overly judgmental of others, you know what one of the big problems is? They're far too concerned about others in a way God doesn't want them concerned. And they're far too little concerned about themselves. Obviously, we want to be concerned about one another. We want to love one another. But in these areas of judgment, he's saying, judge yourself. Know yourself. View yourself. And when you get to the last verse here, verse 13, he says, very interestingly, let us not pass judgment on one another any longer, but rather, and as I said before, this word is judge. Judge never to put a stumbling block or hindrance in the way of a brother. If you want to judge something, don't judge their motives. Judge how to best edify them. You see, that's what love does. Didn't Paul say, right there after he said, let your minds be renewed? He said, don't think more highly of yourself than you ought. You see, when you keep your eyes on Christ, He's the Lord. He's the Master. He's the Judge. That helps, that helps you stay pretty in tune to the fact, I'm not those things. He is. Don't think more highly of yourself People who judge are thinking more highly of themselves. Let me just end in this. 
Let's say you go away from this and you think, wow. You know what? When I find differences in the church, I have a tendency to go sit around table with people and say, hey, you know what brother so-and-so thinks or what he believes? And then you just, on your high seat there, you rip the person apart. You mock that person. You laugh that person. You slight that person. Or you're in conversations on the phone with somebody and you know, you know they do this over there. Yeah, I don't know why they do that. There's just a, a tone of sarcasm and cynicism. You're basically always reading the worst. You make assumptions about people's motives and you're constantly coming to the worst. Oh, yeah, I know why they believe that. I know why they did that. And in bottom line, you're always thinking the worst. You're never thinking they really studied the Scriptures and they really are seeking to know God's will and they really want to glorify the Lord and they came to that conviction through the Word of God and I'm going to encourage them to do it because above all things, I want to see the Lord honored. We can be different and honor the Lord and I'm just happy with that. But that isn't the case. You look at your life and you see, no, you've, you've judged people and when it's all sized up, you know. You know in the depths of your heart you do not want to be judged by the same measure you've judged others. If that's where you're at today, I have this to tell you. When God opens those books in Judgment Day, even if He finds 99% of your life was like that, if that book says, even like the thief on the cross, hey, what'd you find there? Open the book on that guy. Whew, man, the Lord's just saying, we're just, you know, we're going to put all that under the blood. We don't have to concern ourselves with this. It's a lot like, Sarah, you know, she laughed in unbelief. You get to the book of Hebrews 11 and it says, by faith. There's no, no mention of it. God's just saying, away with that, away with that. But here, there He is on that cross. Here we see that there was a demonstration of grace in this man's life. I'll tell you, even if you have a life in the books of God full of harsh, critical, and you're saying, I don't want to be judged by it. You fall down before the Lord. You confess your sin. He is faithful and just to forgive it. The Lord alone gives new hearts, changes desires, puts His own image, stamps it on the very fabric of people's nature. What do you think happened? It was this guy who was a thief. And there in those last hours, something was put in the books by which God will look in that day. Brethren, there's enough written in that book to tell us that that man is with the Lord in paradise. You're not going to buy your way in. But what the books tell us are the fruits in your life of those whom God has genuinely saved by faith in Jesus Christ. That's the real issue. If that hasn't been the case, you know full well you don't want to be measured by the measure you have measured others with. You take all that and confess it to the Lord. You hear about Judgment Day, maybe that's unsettling to you. You don't like the thought of that because you know. You know. Brethren, you go to Jesus Christ, you'll, you'll find Him compassionate. He came to save sinners. He came to, find, to save, seek and save harsh judgers. But I tell you this, if you don't come to Him and find in Him healing for your sick soul, and in that day those books are opened, and God says it's all 
judgment. It's all harsh. It's all unloving. It's all critical. So be it. There's no mark of grace on that man's life. We'll judge him accordingly. Folks, that's reality. You say, but I, I, I thought, I, 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 that, that, doesn't, that doesn't sound right. That's exactly right. But even if you've wasted your time, even if you've wasted your life, even if you've, you've got to the place where, look, if you're a child of God, repent of it. So you, you start letting your mind think on these things. You can see them there. You can see. Paul realizes. It's in the mind. Renew the mind. Don't think of yourself more highly than you ought to. Who are you He wants you thinking, who are you to judge the servant of another? Who are you? He wants you thinking, you're not the master. Don't you know judgment day is coming? If you're going to be judges, let's spend our time, church, Let's spend our time judging this. What's the best way to prevent my brother and sister from stumbling? What's the best way to help my brother and sister walk better? And I'll guarantee you 99% of the time it's not going to be by taking your conviction and seeking through your little innuendos, through your subtle amens, or through the little things you say, it's not going to be by shoving your convictions down other people's throats. It's going to be by seeking to lovingly lead one another to be as fruitful, as God-honoring, as God-glorifying as possible all the time in the light of a mind, a renewed mind that is constantly remembering He is Lord and we're headed to a judgment day and I want to so live as to hear well done, good and faithful servant and I want to so live that when my life is sized up and that measuring stick is brought out that I can, you know, they're, though not perfect, the basic fruit of my life was that I was gracious in the way that I dealt with others. That's, that's, that's Bible, folks. James says this, mercy triumphs over judgment. And right there in that context, folks, he's talking about the mercy we show to other. Mercy triumphs over judgment. What a statement. You think on that one. Let your minds be renewed by that one. How are you going to triumph in the day of judgment? You say by the blood of Jesus Christ. Absolutely right. But also by the mercy that the blood, the power unleashed by the blood of Jesus Christ will unleash in every life that has been saved by that blood. Well, God help us to live these truths.